Hey everyone, thanks for your interest in dice counting. And if you were led to this video after watching my other videos, thanks for your time, because I truly believe that time is one of the greatest gifts that you can give anyone. So if you watch my other videos, I'm almost sure by now you have an idea and hopefully an understanding of how I track roles. And what I'm trying to accomplish with this video is to once again try to convince you of the legitimacy and the power of role tracking. So what I'm going to do first is ask a few thought-provoking questions and then I'm going to share some of my observations I've made while tracking 125,000 roles. All right, let's get to it. They say dice rolls are random. There's no way of predicting the next roll, independent events, independent trials, etc. When I say the word random, I'm sure you would associate this video and these violent lightning strikes or the manner in which these particles fall and these dice rolls here within the random category, right? Out of these two illustrations above, it's safe to say the sketch on the right easily fits into the random category as well, while this line drawn here represents order and predictability. Don't believe me? I present you with Exhibit A. This chart represents the probabilities of two dice rolls, and this is how the house always win. What if I told you that there is a bell curve of results within this game that represent better bets for you, the player. Let me explain. So the first thing I'd like to highlight is what's already known about dice roll combinations and their probabilities. So as you can see here, according to this chart, sevens are more likely to come out because there are more combinations or ways to roll it on two dice. Two and twelve are not so likely because there's just not that many ways to roll those two numbers. All right, make sense so far? Check. So I decided to obtain enough raw roll data to accurately represent this chart, and over 10 years, I recorded 125,000 real-life rolls. After that, I threw all the data into a graph to see if the results from the rolls I recorded would mirror this widely accepted chart here about the two dice roll probabilities. And what do you know? We have a bell curve, meaning the distribution of roll combinations from every roll I've recorded so far does in fact mirror or is compatible with this probabilities of two dice roll chart. Now, where do we go from here with all this information? Well, my mind led me to see if I can find patterns, so I decided to break down the numbers even further. I wanted to see the distribution of each dice combination between sevens, or how many times each dice combination would roll before a seven was rolled. All right, here's an example of what I'm talking about. Along this row of numbers, the 10 came out 8 times before the 7 was rolled. I wanted to get this type of information throughout all 125,000 rolls, so I created this chart here. Here are the different parts of the chart. Different dice combinations. Quantity of each dice combination before a 7 out. Here's a quick example to illustrate how many times a 4 was rolled only once up until a 7 out throughout 125,000 rolls. According to this chart, that scenario happened 4,521 times. According to this chart, there were 7 occurrences of 10s rolling 8 times within one series of rolls, or up until a 7 out. And there were 3 occurrences of 4s rolling eight times within one series of rolls. So throughout 125,000 rolls, both the four and 10 coming out eight times or rolling eight times within a series of rolls up until a seven out happened a total of 10 times. I can tell you that both four and 10 rolling eight times each within the same series of rolls until the seven out has not happened yet. The strange thing here to mention so far is that neither of those combinations have rolled more than eight times before a seven out. 
I honestly can't explain why they've peaked out at 8. Currently, my instinct is to lay against whichever number, 4 or 10, is peaking after I've seen it repeat itself the sixth time. I start laying against it and progressively executing a lay bet to account for three possible losses. Here's what that lay betting strategy looks like. I split it into three groups based on how aggressively I might want to gamble. So basically, if I wanted to play conservatively, I would only lay once after the four or ten rolled eight times. A moderate approach would account for one loss, meaning that you would lay after the 410 rolled seven times. Extreme would mean that you would execute a lay bet after the 4 or 10 rolled six times. Now, when you're playing this extreme progressive lay betting style, you are risking a total loss of 666 if the 4 or 10 rolls more than 8 times. If you lose after your target number rolls a 7th time, you would go to the second level and execute a lay bet for $153. The 7th 10 signifies a first loss of $41 in the three-tier extreme progressive betting strategy, increase the lay bet to 153 after the first loss. And if you lost again, you would execute another lay bet at the third and final level. When you're playing this extreme progressive betting style, you're risking a total loss of $666 if the target number, the 4 or the 10, rolls more than eight times. And by the way, if that happens, I definitely want to know as it would be a significant event for me since I haven't seen that in over 700 hours. There were some other interesting things I saw while looking at this data as well. For instance, the most I've seen of any one number being rolled within a series is 17 eights. Here's what that roll looked like. As far as the 2s and 12s, the most I've seen of that is 4 within a roll series. I try my best to label everything as clearly as I can, so if you have any problems understanding anything, pause the video and you can shoot me an email and I can explain further. Here are some labels that will hopefully help you to understand my charts better. And only once did the 2 roll 5 times within 1 series of rolls or up until the 7 out. The most rolls I've seen is an astounding 62, including a 7. Here's a breakdown of each roll throughout this series. And here's the actual roll. The first half. And second half. Another validating aspect of this information is the way that even the total roll distribution for each number line up. There is that same sort of bell curvish pattern going all the way through to indicate that natural distribution of rolls for each number as we would expect. Now here's a part of the data that proves to me that rolls are indeed connected. Multiple events also fall into that bell curve distribution pattern. So check this out. I created a program to search for every win combination starting with three consecutive wins, four consecutive wins, five consecutive wins, six wins, seven wins, eight consecutive wins, nine wins, and then I capped it off at ten or greater wins. Now, a win series is a connected event.
Well, after analyzing all my roles data and sorting the wins, there were more cases of three wins than there were of the higher consecutive win series. So in a broader context, based on the data here and your willingness to really grind it out, playing the don't pass after four and or five consecutive wins seems to be a sweet spot. When you start looking at different connected patterns, they all follow that uniform output distribution, just like the original probabilities of two dice roll chart. And wait, before we move on and to further illustrate that multiple rolls are connected, here's the chart with the distribution of consecutive sevens throughout 125,000 rolls. Once again, a smooth line distribution that doesn't reflect the shape or pattern of random. So based on the logic that connected events follow an order, it stands to reason that if you stay at the tables long enough and track certain patterns, you can make certain predictions based on that pattern's output so far. And to prove this, I'm going to show you a little case study I did on the 4s and 10s tendency to peak at 8 rolls within a series of rolls or up until the 7 out. Now, I already showed you the chart that displays the distribution of 4s and 10s throughout rolls. I took it a step further and tracked the output of target numbers between the next 30 sevens, meaning how many times does that same target number, and by target I mean the number that had the high output, roll between the next 30 or so sevens. In this chart, I analyzed the results after a total of 7 or 8 4s or 10s were rolled. Turns out that there were 27 occurrences of the 4s or 10s showing up or rolling 7 or 8 times within a series of rolls. To illustrate what I'm talking about, let's take the data from row 6527, and on that row, 8 4s were rolled. According to the chart, after the 8 4s were rolled and then a 7 out, no 4s were rolled before the next 7, then 2 4s were rolled before the next 7, then no 4s were rolled before the next 7. Now when we expand this chart to reveal all the instances of 7 or 8 rolls of the 4 or 10, you realize that within the yellow region covering rolls there were never more than 2 of the target number rolled. So in summary, it would make sense to employ a betting strategy that allows you to take advantage of the low output of the target number in this region. Here is a breakdown of what would have happened if you had taken advantage of the low output of target numbers in the yellow region. I outlined three betting styles from conservative to extreme, and they all yielded profits from taking advantage of this pattern of connected roles. Well, I'm going to stop here before we go into information overload. I hope you found my information both useful and interesting enough to grab a pen and give dice counting a try. With what I currently know about the connectivity of roles and the existence of patterns, I can never blindly play craps the way I used to. Recording roles gives you a bird's eye view of everything that's going on, and I want you to see what I see. Well, if my information helps you win, I would love to hear about your success. And if it doesn't, if you can please give me as much detailed information as you can about that event, I would really appreciate that. Details such as the date, the time, the players around the table, and more importantly, the sequence of roles leading up to that event. And that way I can update my information and then provide more reliable and better patterns for you in the future. Thanks for watching and don't forget to like my Facebook page and visit my website at www.dicecounting.com. And if you want to take this whole thing to the next level and to better understand the language of dice rolls, you can purchase data, formulas, pattern finders, and much more ammo through my website. Please remember to gamble responsibly and always remember to have fun. That's it. Peace.